Okay, so this is the 14th lecture in the series on creating a sustainable international civilization. Um, and the last lecture started with a discussion of the working group on ethics in action for sustainable development from fall of 2016 to December of 2018. So uh, the first one was about religion, why religion ought to be included, and also that um, it was integrating humanism with all the many, many different religious traditions and branches. So here's the, again, it's Panchasila. It goes back to principle number three. Principle number four, um, we're trying to get unity and diversity, and we're trying to do it through deliberation, talking among pe pe diverse people. So this, this is how it met. There was coming together of the Pope's statement on the need for a sustainable civilization, the United Nations General Assembly, the Sustainable Development Goals, and then the Paris Agreement. So they brought together representatives of all these traditions and asked, you know, how can we find common ground? So the second part of the group of the book, each members of each of these traditions talked about their idea of the common good. Now, this particular lecture and lecture series uh, focuses on Islam. The entire book is very relevant to the creation of the very type of humanism the world needs, starting with the model Indonesians need just to be faithful to their own political ideology. So um, Indonesians need to have this kind of humanism just to be good Indonesians. And then by choosing the excerpts from the Muslims, um, it will be, they will be good Indonesians they will be good humanists and they would be really good Muslims all at the same time, which is what Mr. Marif, what his book emphasized. That was his real commitment. And he wants to develop a curriculum based on that. And so the, this group came together and they're very interested also in developing a curriculum, an international curriculum. So the chapters on Islam are written by... Um, Hamza Yusuf, which of course I'm torturing his name, who was the president of uh, the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college in the United States. Now this is of great interest to me because my entire career in higher education ever since I left home to go to college has been at small liberal arts colleges. And so I understand at those institutions, the founding of those institutions was focused on combining moral and intellectual virtues. It was very Aristotelian. You could say it was deliberately structured on Aristotle, or it wasn't deliberately Aristotelian, but it's extremely consistent with Aristotle. And once again, the reason to bring in Aristotle is he's very systematic. And that's in case you're skipping around in the lectures, lecture two and three are his system of personal, social, and political virtues. And again, I could have even said more on those lectures because I didn't, I didn't mention the vices very much, but each virtue has corresponding vices. So the virtue is a middle ground between, between extremes, uh, but liberal arts schools it was it's important that the professors at those schools also have strong moral characters because part of their job is to be uh, role models, be en loco parentis, replace the parents as adult role models and mentors to lead young people into adult life. This was a big deal in Athens. And the sophists, Socrates was um, competing against the sophists for being the mentor of the next generation. He failed. The sophists sort of won out because they were better at rhetoric and they 
taught young people how to use rhetoric to get whatever they wanted, power or money, and it destroyed the democracy. Um, but anyway, to have to find out that it was a person who was the president of a Muslim liberal arts school is really important because my colleagues at the Islamic State Universities in Indonesia are aware of the need to have the integration of moral and intellectual virtues, but they still teach at universities. So they're huge and they have specializations, whereas liberal arts schools are much less specialized and the teachers are teach in interdisciplinary ways so that the the topics that students learn can also be interconnected. And so in my own uh, history, I started out at Oberlin College. It didn't have the same worldview. It was a liberal arts school, but it had lost its religious foundation. And so it was not only secular, it was actually a deconstruction secular worldview, which did not really come out until uh, two decades later, they had a terrible lawsuit. So I left there because it wasn't what I was looking for. It wasn't what I was raised with, which was the union of reason and faith. So I transferred to another liberal arts college and I had a teacher, a philosophy teacher I loved. Well, it turned out he was also a Methodist preacher's son, which I was a Methodist preacher's daughter. And that was, we were raised to unite reason and faith. We were raised to care about social justice. He was Asian American. And when he was in his coming of age in high school was when Pearl Harbor happened and the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And there was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment in the U.S. And his father's church got uh, there were riots around his father's church. So his father worked with the mayor, the governor of Colorado, and they made the state a safe haven for Asian Americans as much as they could, but they made efforts to do that. Okay, when I came of age, um, it was during the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, Vietnam War, and environmental movement. So my father was very activist in terms of creating a sustainable civilization. This was 55, 57 years ago and civil rights and also uh, the militarism of the US, the military industrial complex. We're making too much money on war and the people who make money don't send their kids to war. So he was calling all of that out, American desire for uh, empire building. First, it was military empire building, and since then it has morphed into economic uh, empire building. But just the whole idea, when I went to college, my professors were very prominent in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the environmental movement. They were people of very high moral uh, integrity. And so the idea was that you question the powerful, you question religious leaders and institutions, you question political, you question anybody with power and force them to be transparent and accountable. And if you disagree, you speak out. So I was in many nonviolent demonstrations over the years, uh, human rights demonstrations, uh, nuclear war, anti-nuclear we had a nuclear freeze, no more nuclear weapons. That was another campaign. We had all the Iraq, the anti-Iraq war. I mean, it went on and on. So I have a whole history of doing that, which I very much believe in. But that was really liberal arts uh, in the U.S. especially because the, the leaders, the president of Yale, all these educators were very deliberate about maintaining these liberal arts schools, establishing them because they wanted a broader public to be educated in this way that combined character education and religion with science, social science and reason. 
This was a big deal in the United States, which is very sad that we're losing it. But anyway, it's good that one of the main representatives at this conference was um, the president of the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college, which I find extremely surprising. And then, or just, you know, sort of an amazing synchronicity. Then when I went to grad school, I went to a small liberal arts school, which is very rare. They just happened to have a master's program and a PhD program. I went there because they studied, uh, their program was based on the history of ideas rather than on analytic philosophy. Analytic philosophy was the trendy, uh, the latest trend in how to read Plato, which had nothing to do with Plato, but it gave you status. You could publish in university presses. You could publish in status, high status journals. You could get a job at a high status college university and you created your little silo of like-minded people whereas at the small liberal arts school it was an absolutely top-notch liberal arts school Bryn Mawr but Bryn Mawr also had become very secular and so I my approach to Plato was not the same as Bryn Mawr. Bryn Mawr was moral relativism that you just keep the conversation going um, just see how they're talking to each other. Well, that's not fair. They Each one of those great books, authors, was claiming to talk about the truth, and you ought to ask them, you know, you ought to critique them according to whether they got it right. Was their mind a microcosm and the macrocosm? What were they doing in their relationship to the natural world? How were they creating a culture that integrated with nature or detached itself from nature? Those are the really important questions, but that wasn't what got asked in grad school. But anyway, I got the degree and then I taught at the University of St. Thomas, which was a more conservative Catholic school. And again, I was told certain things you teach, certain things you don't teach. And I was an adjunct there. And then I taught at the College of St. Benedict's, which is a women's liberal Catholic school. And then, you know, I felt more at home, but I didn't get a tenure track job. So then I ended up at Lyon College, which is a Presbyterian school, which did uh, want to unite reason and faith. That was a very important foundation because it was located in rural Arkansas and 80% of the local people split reason and faith. So my students often say, uh, faith is believing without evidence. So if you believe in God, you're not supposed to have any evidence. And if you try to have evidence, it shows you don't have faith. And they didn't accept evolution, all of these things, which were not the way I was raised. And they're not the way this organization. So this conference was based on St. Thomas Aquinas and he united reason and faith. And he thinks the all the sciences related to sustainability, the Catholic church is very concerned that the faith be associated with sustainable uh, goals and all the knowledge we have. So all the sustainable development goals are, they have science, social science, psychology, they have um, reason, various disciplines, uh, various academic dif disciplines to support the legitimacy of this worldview that the all the different religious traditions are coming to agree on. So this, common ground is going to be consistent with the religious traditions, um, many versions of humanism, the, and the sciences and the social sciences. So we're bringing it all together. Um, okay, so Mr. Yusuf was ranked by the Muslim 500 as the 22nd most influential Muslim worldwide. So I'm really glad they got this very prominent person to write the section on Islam. I can only 
you know, pick and choose a few quotes. And I did choose the quotes I wanted to, to support my point of view. Um, and you can pick up the book and read it. I don't think anything he said contradicted what I'm saying, but certainly he had more to say than I'm going to be able to repeat here. He's a proponent of the traditional liberal arts and great books education in both the Western and the Muslim traditions. And so, again, I have presented in an earlier lecture that when the Greek schools got closed by Justinian, the Greek scholars went to Persia and then uh, Muhammad came and went, but the tradition of Greek humanism got integrated with Islam and that's what he's interested in. That's, you can just tell by reading this, that that's the tradition he knows about. And so he picks liberal arts is consistent with and actually foundational for this view of passing on humanism and understanding humanism and the great books. So there are great books in the Muslim tradition also. Um, and uh, so we'll talk about more of those in a second. So he says that the religions have normative traditions, which are norms. They're, they're an ethos. They're an idea of a good way of life that are not subject to relativist interpretations. They have norms that are universal based on the human condition. And that's what I've been arguing with Aristotle. And that's what I've been also arguing for the traditions. And then always going back to Panchasila at numbers one and two. For Muslim, four foundational sources establish the faith. The prophetic practice, the consensus among scholars, and reason. So it's reason and revelation. Um, what the Quran calls light upon light, revelation upon reason, guide our lives. Okay? So, again, you can agree on that. And then you can also hold people accountable for what, how they understand revelation. Because in the Old and Old Testament, the New Testament, um, there are authors, the authors in the Old Testament actually disagree with each other. And so when people say the Bible's inerrant, um, everything is true, well, they don't agree with each other. And so they didn't actually talk to each other. It's just that the people who, the wise people who put together the Old Testament, the New Testament, deliberately picked authors that felt that God spoke to them and said different things, like they had different ideas of the message. You could say, well, in the context, or you could say lots of things. But the final conclusion to me is that everybody at the end of the day is accountable for what they think God is saying to them. Like you can't just say anything. Um, you have to really reflect on this because the stakes are pretty big. And that's why coming together with like-minded people is really important because it can refine your revelation, your idea of which things, which insights you've had, which you think really are authentic, really are what God wants. And if you agree with these people on a whole lot of other stuff, you ought to be able to agree on revelation. Um, or if you agree to disagree on some points, they have decided that the major points they can agree on. There are certain normative uh, messages that have been claimed to be the result of reason or the result of revelation or the result of putting them together um, that are common and they don't undermine each other. According to the understanding of Islam's normative tradition, and these are quotes, uh, Muslims embrace a faith that declares a restoration to a primordial religion, the re religion of all the states. So we've seen this word primordial before, and that's what I have said about Aristotle. It starts with the, the brainstem, the really primitive drives we have. And so these traditions have arisen from 
this consciousness of this primitive drives and they agree on what we need to do to integrate pleasure and fear to into civilization, how to tame them, how to transform them to the point where we take pleasure in living a civilized life, helping each other flourish. And that prevents us from being afraid. We're not as afraid of other people. We trust them. We have goodwill for them. And so we can make better judgments about what to fear and what not to fear. And we also, if you live in a society that's too violent, dangerous, and chaotic, it's just going to self-destruct. So how to prevent, how to create a culture where you don't have as much to fear, and then how to stop the fear and get it directed toward love and toward weaving people together. Um, that's what primordial religions are. That's the task they have. The two main bodies of the Islamic moral code are the devotional, which regulate your relationship with the creator, and the interpersonal, which governs norms dealing with our fellow humans. So I know Jesus said, you know, the essence of the law and the prophets is to love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And then another person at the conference considered one of the, he's considered one of the most prominent and accomplished legal, theoretical, and spiritual scholars in Islamic history. He argued that the three phases comprise the formation of the Islamic tradition, revelation, consolidation, and organization. So they, they had two excellent representatives at this conference. He says, quote, while many verses of the Quran directly relate to ethics and countless traditions of the Hadith literature deal directly with ethical matters, perhaps the clearest being the Prophet's statement, I was sent only to complete noble character. We cannot underestimate the impact of Al-Farabi's commentary. Uh, geez, I'm not going to try to pronounce these names, and another person's translation of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So, so this person who is a very prominent Islamic, right? They didn't just pick him. He's considered one of the most prominent and accomplished scholars, okay? And he is the one that emphasized the, the, the Muslims who made a commentary on Aristotle and the, the Muslim who translated Aristotle. At the outset of the fifth century, um, another Muslim scholar in the book, The Refinement of Character, introduced the beginnings of an Islamicized Greek ethics. During this time, philosophical ethics spread. Both Christians and Muslims contributed to the genre of ethical treatises. So, so, you know, the conference was held at the Pontifical Academy in um, Rome, but they found very prominent scholars who achieved their notoriety uh, apart from the fact that they were uh, focused or a very important branch of their scholarship is related to creating an Islamicized Greek ethics. And so they consider themselves part of this tradition. So, um, so in the past, the refinement of character introduced the beginnings of this tradition and they are carrying it on. I'm sure there've been many, many steps along the way, but they see it as their job to, in their generation, to carry on an Islamicized Greek ethic within the context of this conference. Um, and I, what I know about is the way this activity went on in Southern Spain with Avecina and Averos. So I know about those two. Uh, and I, I'm not surprised to find out they're a lot more, a lot more nuanced and a, and a lot more extensive activity uh, that we've, I mean, we also have the history has gotten buried. It's hard to find the history or 
The history might have been located in Cairo or Damascus or Baghdad, but Western scholars didn't bother to read it or to pass it on to the point. So I learned the great books tradition, but I never learned about um, Southern Spain and the link between uh, rabbis, the Jewish, Christian, and Islam translation project and the Islamicized um, Aristotelian ethics, Greek ethics. I never knew about that until very recently. And there's nothing in the curriculum, even to this day, you can get a the vast majority of PhDs in Aristotle or Plato would never mention it. Uh, hopefully some of them do. Um, you know, I'm sort of past that point, but it's really sad because it's inaccurate. There was a tradition. It's perfectly compatible. There's no, you don't have to pervert either Aristotle or Islam to link them together. And it did exist. We just pick and choose uh, in graduate, the teachers in graduate school pick and choose what they want to assign. They themselves were never aware of it probably. And so the ignorance gets passed down from generation to generation. But I'm really excited about the fact that I can be part of a project working with Muslims in Indonesia to continue that tradition of an Islamicized um, Christian ethic. And um, also, you know, I've been working my whole life on, I mean, an Islamicized Aristotelian ethic. So I've been working on the Aristotelian part of it and linking that back to Greek culture. So that's what I would have to add. Um, and I would love to talk to these scholars and see what they think. So who knows, I might live long enough. Um, so the Christian and the Muslim, uh, both influenced by the Greeks, wrote books on virtue ethics. Then in the late, this was, you know, 974, this is early, this is the first century. Then later on in the fifth century, another scholar put forward a profound philosophical ethics rooted in the Quran and undergirded by an Aristotelian framework. So he's giving us, you know, the books to read and the history to find out about. Based on this tradition, Ethics in Action and other partners have committed as a group to prepare a new course on the virtues of a sustainable society, engaging the world's leading religious and philosophical tradition. They will seek out best practices of virtue education across those traditions. So I myself, in another year or two, would really like to try and hunt down these scholars and find out what they're doing, find out this new course that they're developing. Um, let people at Muhammadiyya institutions know what's going on, and also at UN institutions to see if they can incorporate that into their curricula. And um, as well as, you know, in America where I live, so the conclusion is international conferences today that aim for developing a worldview need to create a global civilization. Um, they're looking to the humanistic branches of each religious tradition and to the spiritual humanism of Aristotle and other wisdom traditions. They include modern humanism, but only insofar as those modern and contemporary views can be integrated with the global foundation. This means science is not separated from quote unquote religion. It means the sciences should be used to integrate culture and nature, not to exploit nature indefinitely. And it means the human psyche cannot be manipulated by rhetoric or other ways of controlling behavior without respecting each person's dignity. So we do have a basic humanity and that includes both basic drives, but also basic dignity. We're not blank slates and we shouldn't be treated as if controlling behavior will succeed in controlling the person's mind. Um, okay, so 
that's that's um, exciting. I mean, I hope that my colleagues at UN schools will be inspired by this. I myself hope that a branch of my scholarship will head in this direction. And so that's the second lecture on that conference.